All right, it's three o'clock. I'll continue to let people into the into the um, session as they come into the waiting room. But on behalf of the New York Flute Club, I would just like to welcome everybody who's here this afternoon. And we welcome um, Professor Leonard Garrison, who, as you can see from the screen, is Professor of Flute at the University of Idaho. He's a former uh, program chair of the National Flute Association and a past president of the NFA as well. And so we're grateful to have him here today to um, share with us some insights on Telemann's Fantasias. So with no further ado, Professor Garrison. Thank you so much, Jenny. And it's such an honor. I appreciate this invitation and uh, to present for the New York Flute Club, um, uh, an organization I've admired for, for so many years. Um, so thank you so much. And, um, uh, and I didn't even have to travel to New York to do this. So um, basically today I'm describing my COVID project because um, all of us have been seeking out more and more repertoire for unaccompanied solo flute, right? Because we can't play with anybody else until we're safely done with this thing. Um, but the, the 12 Fantasias have held um, a great obsession for me all my life. Um, and this only increased in, in the last year. Um, and the subtitle of this, An Ingenious Solution, uh, you, will become apparent to you in, in a couple of minutes. Um, but the, the project um, um, actually began um, over the last um, couple of decades. Um, uh, every time I play one of these Fantasias, um, I um, will come up with my own, own ornamentation. Um, for that that particular piece, and um, I realized that I had uh, ornamentations about for you know about two thirds of the pieces, and and so I thought maybe I should just um, make my own edition of this piece, and at the same time I should record my um, my performances of the twelve Fantasias as kind of a companion. So this actually came to pass um, that um, my edition is, is going to be released by Theater Presser later this year, and my recording, my CD, is going to be released on uh, Centaur Records later this year. Um, so um, uh, we all know that Telemann um, uh, lived at the same time as J.S. Bach, and of course Bach, we consider one of the great composers of, of history, but at it, during their time, their lifetime, Telemann was much more famous than Bach and uh, was considered by his contemporaries as the greatest um, German composer of his age. Um, but in writing for solo flute, which was very unusual at the time, uh, think of how few pieces we have for that medium, uh, it, it was quite a challenge because it's a very limited medium. After all, it's, um, it's just pure, pure melody, monophony. It doesn't have harmony. It doesn't have counterpoint. And, um, you know, uh, the whole set is for solo flute, so it's very limited in tone color. But um, this is the ingenious solution. Um, even though the title of the collection is um, a Fantasia's um, for solo instrument without bass. In fact, Telemann provides a bass line almost everywhere in these pieces. For instance, in the third Fantasia in the Gigue, um, the circled notes the are the bass notes. Also, there's uh, throughout the whole set, there's a sense of counterpoint, um, which is, of course, hard to achieve for a single line um, medium. Um, but um, almost ev everywhere, there's a sense of at least two voices, if not more. 
And in fact, um, there are several um, strict fugues, including in Fantasia number no. one, which starts with um, with a little introductory prelude, and then in Measure Eleven, the fugue starts. And this is um, a draft of my edition. So my edition includes, um, a, you know, very simple fugal analysis. It shows you where the fugue subject appears. So also special about this collection is um, a very systematic exploration of keys. Um, the, the order of the keys is significant because it marches straight up the scale from A through G. And it includes really all of the keys that were commonly used in Baroque flute music. Um, of course, no one ever expected the flute to play an A flat major or something like that but these these are all the keys that um most of the composers used and uh, along with the keys as we'll see it allows um Telemann to explore the whole range of expression um because uh, keys uh, all had their different expressive characteristics um another special element of the fantasias is each one of them has at least one dance now none of these dances are actually indicated in the score but we can easily uh, recognize that um, some of them are bourrées or canaries or courants or gavats or gigs or minuets passe pieds serrebande or tambourin and so on um so uh, we should stop and think, um, what does he mean by the title? What is a Fantasia? Because I believe this has um, led to a lot of modern players misinterpreting the meaning of this word. So in the 18th century, a piece was called a Fantasia when it was a short work with contrapuntal elements. It did not mean just a free form work. So. I think, especially in the dance movements and the fug fugal um, movements, the the um, call for rubato and um, and so on is 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 rather limited. So it's not a free form piece. In fact, they have very uh, distinct forms. Um, but uh, also significant that is that um, fantasy in German means imagination, and of course, Telemann is showing a great deal of imagination in these pieces, stretching the form of, um, of the solo, uh, the medium of the solo flute. So before I embarked on this project, or as rather as a first step, I thought, well, I should know all of the editions that exist and all of the um, recordings that exist. And as you might imagine, there's a huge amount of material. These pieces are everywhere. And so you can um, read my survey of the editions and recorder, recordings in the Flutist Quarterly published by the National Flute Association uh, from its fall issue. Um, there are quite a few editions. Um, and um, these started with Telemann himself. Um, he was quite an entrepreneur. And it was an unusual thing and a very expensive thing to print music um, during his lifetime. But um, uh, even though he, uh, this title page doesn't even have his name on it, and his name is nowhere in this collection, but we know it's by Telemann. Who else could it be by? Um, and it's a thought that um, this publication was from somewhere in between uh, 1728 and 1732 in Hamburg, where he was working. Um, the um, title page has, um, besides the missing of the composer, uh, you probably notice what else is unusual about it. Uh, it says fantasies for violin without bass. Um, but it is definitely not violin music because it, there aren't double stops. Um, 
it is restricted to the range of the Baroque flute. It is restricted to the keys that the Baroque flute plays on. And besides, there's an, a separate collection of 12 fantasies for violin, specifically for violin by Telemann. So these are, um, these are flute pieces. Um, now, Telemann was just embarking on his printing career at that time. And so um, in some respects, this um, publication, there's one, only one copy extant of this in a library in Europe. Um, <clears throat> well, in some respects, um, this was not a successful publication. So, um, you know, most of the Fantasias, um, well, all of them have multiple movements, up to four movements. And each piece, he fits on one page. He fits all the movements on one page. So there, it's very crowded and very kind of smudgy. And the clarity of printing is not so great. Um, so it, um, it's amazing to me to think that um, these pieces um, were out of circulation from the early 18th century through 1955, because the first modern edition only came out with the Baron Rider that year. And so even though we've played Bach for um, over 100 years now on the flute, um, we've only played uh, these Telemann fantasies for, um, you know, 60, 70 years. Um, and the, the flute fantasies were part of the Telemann complete edition compiled by Baron Rider. So I grew up with this edition and many of my contemporaries also did. And we've always trusted it because, you know, you trust Baron Rider, but as, as we'll see, it's not that trustworthy. And the problem is um, when you buy the flute edition, it doesn't have the Kredische Bericht, the, the uh, preface that will explain the choices they made in, um, in notes and rhythms and so forth. Um, so one problem, for instance, um, of, of many, I'll just uh, show you a few things. Um, the form of this uh, presto movement from number four, when you look at Baron Rider, you say, oh, this is a, this is a, um, a binary form with two repeated sections. Um, so very common in the Baroque, a lot of dance movements were in that form. But if you look at Telemann's original print, the second section does not have an ending repeat. Uh, rather, it has a DS that goes back to the beginning. So the form is not really binary. Um, it is more like ternary ABA uh, because you play the first section, then the second, and then you come back and do a dal senio to the to the beginning. And and so it really affects the balance of the piece and um, and your interpretive choices. Um, there are many pitch discrepancies between Berenreiter and um, Telemann's original. And uh, by the way, you can download Berenreiter from IMSLP. Um, the version there is what I'm what I've scanned here and somebody has made various pencil marks on it. So I'm sorry, it's not so clean and clear. But um, uh, an interesting pitch discrepancy is Baron Ryder has in the middle of bar five a G sharp, which somebody has crossed out. And because there's a G natural in, um, in the original print. Now, let me uh, play, uh, I think this is Rampal. Um, this is what the G sharp sounds like. That's what I grew up with, and um, until just a very short time ago, that's what I played. Um, but um, now this measure is broken up in Telemann's original so that that G is at the beginning of the second line, and the sharp in front of the G is not a G sharp, but that's um, this is the way a single sharp in the key signature was usually displayed at the time the f sharp is duplicated on the top line in the bottom space so it's a g natural and um here's rachel brown playing the same uh piece and it shows you the g natural is 
less um it's more of a surprise but it does make sense and she's really emphasizing that note So I think most of these pitch discrepancies were um, probably the editors casting doubt on on what Talamon um, had had written because they're sometimes they're a little strange, but but uh, strangeness can be a good thing. Um, another example of a discrepancy, not so much a pitch discrepancy, is in the little uh, slow introduction to the final movement, um, or no, the, the middle movement of number 11. Um, so the second uh, measure, um, uh, Berenreiter has at the end of the second measure, uh, an F sharp dotted half note. That doesn't even exist in Telemann's original. Um, Telemann's original just stops with those two eighth notes. And so it's an incomplete measure. Um, so, uh, some of the more recent recordings um, do, um, uh, you know, perform an incomplete measure at that point. And there are many other discrepancies of pitch. I won't go over every every one, but just so that you, the main point is not to trust Baron Ryder all that much. Um, and by the way, uh, the subsequent editions that came out of uh, from after Baron Ryder, a lot of the edited um, uh, editions like Rampal and Larieux and so on, they depend on what what Baron writers, so they have the same uh, discrepancies. Um, so uh, another interesting, I will play this one for you, um, these ascending and descending scales in um, number 12, um, Baron Ryder adds an E flat in a couple of places, so it kind of makes it look like a G uh, uh, melodic minor scale, but it's not in G minor at this point of the piece, it's in D minor, and so there's no reason for this. But anyway, here's an early recording from the 70s of Paula Robeson, and she, she does follow the Baron Ryder. Oops. It skipped, sorry. Now here's a recording with uh, Ashley Solomon. He's a British Baroque flutist and he does not play the E flat. So I think it makes a lot more sense. Um, by the way, Paula's recording is um, one of the few that you can't, well, it's on YouTube now, but it is out of print. Um, so um, if you're looking for a good or text edition, there are two that I really admire. This uh, one on the left side of the screen is the Breitkopf and Hertel, um, and um, um, originally published by Musica Arara. And the editor is Bartold Koiken, the Baroque flutist, and he has a wonderful preface, and it's very carefully edited, um, and it also has the facsimile of Talamon's original print side by side. So great edition, and also this Henley is um, is a wonderful, very careful, carefully edited. A uh, bonus to that one, it has a little article by Rachel Brown about the performance practice and and the the Henley also includes um, the facsimile of the original print. So now we come to my edition. Why why do we need another edition? Um, and uh, this is not a um, urtext, although it's it's very faithful to the original. It's what I call a teaching edition. So um, it does include uh, all of my ornamentation written out. Um, and it has an extensive preface with, uh, you know, performance notes and historical background. I do include a facsimile, the original print, and, and as you saw, this simple fugal analysis and, and um, you know, I, what I consider tasteful articulation and dynamics 
Um, a lot of the older edited editions have slurs that um, you know one probably wouldn't do if one really understood Baroque principles. And then um, you know metronome indications, which of course Telemann didn't have. Um, but I do retain all of Telemann's original markings. I don't change any of his slurs and so on. Now we come to the recordings, which are kind of based on editions, and there's a huge amount of uh, material here. There are over um, 50 complete sets. The earliest recording, and again, this is amazing, considering that we have so many of them now, was um, uh, only in, in 1971 with the great French flutist Maxence Larieux. What a beautiful sound. And um, so you'll find that a lot of the modern players use more slurs than the Baroque players. Um, and um, their tempos aren't quite what uh, are typical of Baroque players. Um, and of course, they use more vibrato. But um, still, I love the Maxence Larieux recording. And my favorite classic recording is, um, is by Rampal from uh, just a couple of years later, 1973. Um, and, uh, and of course he loves fast tempos. So um, there are many, many recordings on modern flute, but the, the modern flutist who I think captures a kind of a typical Baroque sound the best and is also um, very conscientious of, of Baroque performance practice and, um, and has a very discreet use of vibrato and also kind of inner freedom within the beat is that of um, Emmanuel Pallu. I love his sense of timing. So then um, we look at um, recordings on Baroque flute and the classic in this realm is by Bartold Koiken. And um, his mastery of the technique of the Baroque flute is just stunning. There's not a single note out of tune. Um, there's not a single awkward moment. And his performances are, his interpretations are rather straightforward but uh still still wonderful <clears throat> Um, one of my favorites in the Baroque flute realm is by Jed Wentz, the American 
uh, flutist who lives in um, the Low Countries, um, and his he takes a lot more chances than anybody else. I think uh, surprises at every turn. He'll stretch notes that you don't expect to be stretched. Um, uh, he'll take tempos that you don't expect. Um, it, it's the, um, it's just um, a delightful uh, collection. And um, of course, Rachel Brown is uh, probably um, reflects the dance tradition better than than anybody else. Um, uh, so, um, and her playing sometimes surprises me because, um, as we'll talk about in a minute when we explore the various dances, the dances have social in implications. Some of their aristocratic dances, some of their country dances, and so she she gets pretty gritty on some of these country dances. Then more recorder players than Baroque flute players have recorded. There are many, many sets on that. Probably the most interesting and unusual is that by uh, Maria Di Martini. And um, she, this is not for purists. Um, she takes the Telemann 12 Fantasias only as a starting point and uh, plays around with them. So she's using multi-tracking. She's playing everything there. I, in going into this project, I didn't think I would like any of our pieces played by other instruments, but um, I was um, uh, seduced by François Leleu, the wonderful um, French oboist. He's one of um, quite a few oboists who have recorded this set of fantasies. Gorgeous, shapely phrasing. Of course, um, these pieces are often played on any number of instruments and in their recordings. We won't get into that. Um, so my recording um, is physically out, but it hasn't been um, released. It won't be until June. But the cover art that I chose is um, from, um, from Hamburg when Telemann was working there. His job was to be music director of all of the city's churches, and you see them right there. <clears throat> so um, 
let's spend a few minutes uh, talking about performance practice and then there'll be time for a, a dialogue with you. Um, uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. So probably first and foremost is this idea of extempore ornamentation as Quantz calls it. He writes a chapter on this idea of adding ornaments to what is on the printed page. And this was always expected in slow movements or in any kind of repetition. So for instance, your binary form when you have both um, halves of a, of a dance repeated, that would be expected to have some kind of ornamentation. But Quantz um, has a warning about um, such ornaments. Uh, he says they should be used like seasoning in a meal. In other words, if you don't have enough, it's bland. And if you have too much, it's uh, you can't eat it. You know, it, it, you can't digest it. Um, so, um, you know, just the right mix of ornaments um, so that you're not inundating the original. Um, and what better model um, than Talmud's well-known 12 methodische sonaten or methodical sonatas now, this is the original print that Telemann himself did a few years later than the Fantasia. So you can see how um, he progressed as a printer. This is much clearer and, and uh, a better print. But the way it's organized, and I'm sure many of you know this collection, is there are three lines, and um, the bottom line is the basso continuo. The top line is the simple flute part, and the middle line is the ornamented flute part. So we can all steal from Telemann and, and borrow his ideas and learn from him. Um, and so here's an example of my ornamentation and how I present it in this edition. So this is, this is a binary form piece, and so I write out the, the repeat and um, and the second time through shows the ornamentation. So, and this is my recording. So another um, element of our uh, interpretation is the consideration of the keys. Each key in the Baroque period had a special character and color. And if you play Baroque flute, this is much more apparent to you because some of the, some of the fingerings have cross fingerings so that the, the note has a more covered sound than other fingerings, which are other notes, which have a more open fingering. And in addition to this, um, there are many 18th century writers who associate uh, specific keys with specific affects. Um, and if you look at Telemann's music and you compare, say, everything written in G minor, it'll have more or less um, a consistent um, character to the music. So uh, it's just through the accumulation of experience that, that you learn to associate um, certain moods and characters with the key that you're playing in. Uh, repeats, I take all the repeats because I think they're very important for the form and after all they enable the uh, ornamentation. Um, now trills, Talmon marks all his trills with a plus sign and some people say, oh, a plus sign means any ornament. 
I don't think that's true. I think they always mean a trill in his music. Um, and they always start on the upper note on the beat with a fingered upper note, um, which we emphasize because it's um, a dissonance, which resolves to the lower note. Um, and a subtlety about the performance of trills, they don't have to trill into the last possible moment, but they can settle in on the main note about halfway through the main note. Um, and at cadences following quants and uh, also CT Bach, we can add um, a termination to the trill, a turn at the end of the trill. I wanted to point out a special case in the Fantasias, which is kind of a pet peeve of mine. And it's in the first, uh, towards the end of the first movement of the first Fantasia, there's this trill, and this is Telemann's original print, on a C sharp. Um, it's preceded by a low D sharp. Now the uh, we're playing in A major, and this passage is actually an A major, and a lot of modern players start the trill on a D sharp. Um, they play a whole step trill. It just drives me crazy. I think um, that confuses the key, um, and so um, like many of the Baroque players, I, I play a D natural in that case. And you go on to the immediately to the second movement in uh, in A major and not in E major. Um, the you know the uh, a D nat, D sharp does not carry through um, an octave and um, and most Baroque co composers would have remarked um, an accidental if they had met one. Um, now let's talk briefly about the dances. Um, um, there's a wonderful chart in a very comprehensive long article by uh, Zigud Eppinga in Tibia. It's a two-part article, um, but she outlines the all 12 um, Fantasias, a kind of formal plan of them. And as you see, most of the last movements are dances, um, and, uh, and we can identify, for instance, the the first Fantasia ends with a minuet and then second with a bourrée and a gig and so on. So I agree with most of these choices. Um, there are a couple of ones I really question. So for instance, the, the first movement of the eighth, I don't think it's an Allemande. I, I, I for instance, Rachel Brown thinks it's an Allemande, but I, I don't think so. Um, but the important thing about dances, um, modern players tend to play everything very evenly. But um, dances require a big hierarchy of the beat that downbeats are much stronger than other beats. So we have to have a sense of strong and weak beats. And dances um, also imply a certain tempo and a certain character. So we need to learn what those dances are just through experience. Uh, vibrato is, of course, a big point of contention. Um, but um, it's the most important, and we're not going to solve with this one, right? But the most important thing to keep in mind was that the continuous vibrato that many players uh, use, most players use now, was um, only came in um, in the 20th century. Uh, so th throughout the 19th century and before, vibrato was only an ornament. It was used on certain notes. And so my approach, even on modern flute is um, to practice a piece with no vibrato at first and then decide, well, where am I going to add the vibrato and, and not as a continuous element. Articulation, a uh, very important um, uh, area of interpretation. So um, Telemann was rather specific because he printed these about slurs, so we should respect his, but we can add others. Um, and uh, another Point of confusion. He marks his staccato with a vertical line um, because the dot that we use for a staccato just wasn't used at that time. So the vertical line does not mean an accent. It means staccato, simply. Um, uh, one articulation to avoid if you're adding to what Telemann did 
is the two slurred two tongue because that only came in in Mozart's period. So it's not very typical of Baroque music. Another thing to avoid is slurring between um, uh, between voices. So if you have a bass uh, voice and an upper voice, you don't slur between those, but you isolate those two so that's clear you have two different voices. Um, and then beyond that, um, Baroque players are really good about varying their type of tonguing. So there's not just slurring and tonguing, but there are many different uh, subtleties of tonguing. Um, and in fact, uh, you can follow Quan's, he, um, his rule of intervals is that your close intervals, your stepwise motion is legato, and your, um, your jumps and leaps are more staccato. Now, in terms of uh, double tonguing, uh, Quan's syllables were diddle. I find that hard to do on the modern flute. So I say da 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 but I try to get the sound of the diddle, the more liquid flowing and light and smooth sound. So I'm definitely not saying tucka. Um, now, phrasing and dynamics, um, uh, I plan every breath meticulously. In fact, these are all um, notated in my edition. And so I don't leave anything to chance. Um, you know, most flutists tend to start um, shaping their phrases according to contour, which is nice, you know, going up and making a crescendo, going down, make a diminuendo. But there are other things to consider, especially in Baroque music meter, as we've seen, the downbeat is much stronger than the other beats. So that doesn't always coincide with the contour. Yeah. The harmony um, is something flutists don't often pay attention to. Um, so um, sorry about that, skipped. Um, so um, uh, know what harmony is implied and bring out those notes. Uh, sometimes that's more important than contour. Um, from quants, we know that the default dynamics for slow movements are piano and, uh, and for fast movements are forte. This is why Telemann, uh, <laughs> you'll be playing along and then suddenly there's a piano and it tells you, whoa, he's assuming I'm playing forte before I get to that, because that's an echo. It doesn't mean we always play those dynamics in those movements, but that is kind of where we start out in our, our planning. Uh, anyway, I did want to leave time for this dialogue and questions. And um, uh, I know we have a few minutes left, so um, I would be really interested in your thoughts and 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 so on. So you can unmute and and um, unscreen yourselves if if you do have a question, or you can put something in the chat too. I'll monitor that. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, uh, Sharon, it's good to hear from you. Wow. Yeah, di ditto. Great presentation. <laughs> I have I have three students studying Telemann right now. And, Great. Uh, I hope they're all listening or, or will access this because um, it's going to be very helpful to them. Well, a, as I started by saying, it's a it's my COVID project. So <laughs> most of my students are playing unaccompanied pieces. So <laughs> it's timely. I, I have a question. Yes. Um, first of all, I, I, I'd like to uh, second that. What a great uh, presentation. Um, and um, my question is a little bit tangential because um, I've done a fair amount of uh, you know research looking at treatises from the 18th century and so forth. And um, while uh, it's it's very clear that uh, in Italian style Baroque music you're expected to do florid ornamentation, I haven't found clear evidence in these treatises that they expected ornamentation or additional ornamentation in the repeats and fast movements. I do it you know, to the extent that it seems tasteful. It seems like a normal thing to do, but have you seen specific calls to add ornamentation in the repeats of fast movements? And if, if so, in which uh, treatises have you seen? Yeah, I haven't seen it. You are correct that way. Um, you know, um, I haven't seen it specifically in treatises so much, um, but there's a very interesting um, collection by C.P. Bach 
um, a keyboard collection called um, Sonaten mit verendeten Reprisen, sonatas with varied reprises. And if you look at these pieces, it's, it's exactly what he does in, in, in the fast movements, in the dance movements. So that that's my license. But, you know, just in, as a general philosophical uh, principle, why are there repeats, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, you need the re you need the very something, but that's really great. I I need to uh, have a look at that music. Yeah. So that, so that's that, that's how many sonatas with varied repeats? Uh gee, I forget. I think there are twelve. I'll look for it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. There are two volumes. It's C. P. Bach sonatas with varied reprises. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, so Catherine, I had a note question in number five, measure 35 in the second movement. Let's see, let me grab my Palamon editions so I know what I'm talking about here, sorry. <laughs> number five, and then number five is the C major, of course. Uh, 35 and... Um, Yes, this is uh, this is very interesting. Um, so this is one place where I depart from Telemann's original. I, I do think there was a mistake in Telemann's printing because this is, um, let me remind everybody, number five, a second movement is this Passacaglia and this is the theme. And then the re theme repeats over and over again in various keys. So we have to play an F sharp there uh, to conform to the to the key. So yeah, that's what I do. I have heard F, F natural and, and it is strange, but you maybe you like that strangeness there. <laughs> it's just a choice that we have to make. Thank you. Thanks for that question. It's a great one, Catherine. Okay, anybody else? Leonard, I just wanted to ask, when did you say your printed edition of this is coming out? When is Presser publishing it? Um, I I don't have a specific timeline on that, but Danny Dorf is helping me with that and, mm -hmm. and Presser is, is going to release it. Um, so sometime this year, sometime in 21, so. Good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great seeing you. Yeah, great, great seeing you. Great, great presentation. Let's Thank you. Job. Very helpful. Indeed. Thank you very much. Well, um, it you know, this is something that will never die because there is so many different things you can do with Telemann. And and by the way, my in writing down um my ornamentations, I don't mean to freeze them, you know. Um students could play exactly what I've given, right? But um, I invite everyone to to do their own thing, you know, and just use that as a model. So, yeah. All right. So, well, thanks for for everything. Thank I you. can I'll, I'll stay on the line if if you need to go and um, do anything. But I'd be glad to um, to answer any other questions or just see who's here and say hi and um thanks again i just um uh, it's been such an honor for me to do this <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> will your let's see will your deck be available a is that mean disc? Will your disc be available at the Flute Cubs website? I don't think so. <laughs> um, I will say that um, the, if you came in late and need to see the beginning of the presentation, it will be archived, I believe, on our YouTube channel. So you can always go back and listen to anything you missed later. So, um, well, on behalf of the Flute Club, I'd just like to thank you, Leonard, for this wonderful presentation. and. Uh, very informative and 
a lot of people looks like joined in to get some great information about this. So we will have to clear the room in just a second to set up for the next event okay. that happens in 10 minutes. But anyway, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Good to see you. Okay, have a good day, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.